Welcome back to the Theo Jaffe podcast. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Carlos de la Guardia. Carlos is a former robotics engineer and longevity scientist who now works as a solo, independent AGI researcher, inspired by the work of Karl Popper, David Deutsch, and Richard Dawkins. In his research, he seeks answers to some of humanity's biggest questions, how humans create knowledge, how AIs can one day do the same, and how we can use this knowledge to figure out how to speed up our minds and even end death. Carlos is currently working on a book about AGI. To support his work, be sure to follow him on Twitter at DELA3499 and subscribe to his Substack, Making Minds and Making Progress, at carlosd.substack.com. This is the Theo Jaffe Podcast. Thank you for listening. And now, here's Carlos de la Guardia. Hi, welcome back to episode two of the Theo Jaffe Podcast. I'm here today with Carlos de la Guardia. And I guess we'll start off by asking, what do you do in a typical day as an AGI researcher? What does that look like for you? Uh, well, partly it's working on my book. Um, so taking uh, the ideas I've kind of worked through in the past and trying to put them in some form that um, is less chaotic than they are in my notes. Um, and then part of it is following various leads of things that have been interesting to me. They're almost, I almost think of it like emails uh, for somebody who uh, doesn't have any collaborators. You know? So the prior day, I'll kind of see interesting things. I'll go into my notes and I'll kind of be working through them one by one um, and see how they connect with all my prior thoughts. And uh, sometimes you'll find things that seem interesting in some very small way, but they'll turn out to connect to all kinds of bigger things. So that's uh, what things tend to look like. And also in the category of like what you do day to day, um, what kind of software do you find the most interesting? Because you ask different people on Twitter and they have such different answers. People, some people want super complex systems. Other people say, oh, just Apple Notes. Hmm. Oh, like so just workflow wise? Yeah. Uh, I, I use Roam right now. Uh, it's like I like the idea of being able to uh, connect things and that's been helpful. Uh, I use Google Keep for just jotting notes down. Um, beyond that, I don't do much. Um, yeah, so I keep it pretty simple, I suppose. In fact, I actually met up with Connor, the CEO or the, the guy who runs Rome, and um, he told me that I probably shouldn't even use Rome because I use it only to like the simplest features, <laughs> and uh, it has like much more advanced things it could do. Um, but uh, but it's been working well so far. So, how much does your um, AGI research overlap with conventional AGI research, kind of like what OpenAI does, where they have neural networks and they're training them on huge GPU clusters and they're monitoring the loss functions and so on. Do you do anything like that? Nope. <laughs> uh, yeah, so mine's, mine's purely theoretical. So I'm I'm focused more on uh, yeah, theoretical questions of what makes humans special and what uh, what is it that we're doing so differently from every other algorithm and animal and uh, system. And uh, I think that's mostly, yeah, for me, a theoretical question that only rarely involves me running like computational experiments. Um, so I, I often think of existing machine learning as being sort of like a bottom-up approach, things that work in practice for some things and making them better and better and better. And I think of myself as more like a top-down almost kind of a approach of saying like, here's these performance uh, or here like these philosophical ideas at this higher level and trying to make them more computational. So I almost think of um, myself as working on, uh, you know, if, if Popper worked on um, the logic, the scientific dis discovery, I think of myself as working on like the practice or the computation of scientific discovery. So it, uh, it, 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 that also means that like nothing I do ever works <laughs> in, the, in the traditional sense of like people running actual code uh, today. So it's pretty unsatisfying to them, I think probably to hear about uh, theoretical ideas because uh, they seem so untested. But on the other hand, I'm often addressing problems that they're not considering at all. Um, so I think that uh, there's a place for the high-level research. So how likely do you think it is that you or someone like you will get to AGI before someone like OpenAI? Consider AGI for the purposes of this, like something that can do, let's say, most of what uh, an economically productive college graduate level human can do. Uh, well, I don't think that's what AGI is necessarily. So that's partly where we uh, differ. Um, so in the sense of like, how soon will it be before I create like a useful system? Maybe never. <laughs> it, it's not really what I'm trying to do. Um, 
I think there's like a fundamental difference between people and tools. And so I'm not working on tools at all, really. Um, I'm curious about what it is that makes humans like fundamentally different from everything else. Um, so I think that my objectives are quite different. And so I, I, the book I'm working on tries to drill down into what those differences are. I think of it more like the human capabilities. Um, it's sort of wrong to think about our minds as like things that can happen to do like lots of specific things. What defines us isn't the many specific things we can do, but the fact that we can think of anything. So uh, if the thoughts that we can hold are unlimited, as I think that they are, that's uh, what defines us. And if you give me any system, how you know however many finite things it can do, I will think that it is fundamentally different from an infinite system like ours. Um, so I think that uh, I also might to I mean, maybe maybe this is too much of a, uh, a tangent, but uh, I often like to compare uh, when people talk about intelligence. I like to break that up into two separate things. One of which is knowledge, and the other which is like the ability to create knowledge. Because I think that if you compare a system like a data center and a baby, a data center has a huge amount of inbuilt knowledge, millions of lines of code running many independent complex processes, and yet it has almost no ability to create new knowledge. Uh, if something new happens it, that wasn't programmed into it, it won't be able to respond. Whereas the baby has almost no knowledge. It's terrible at running a data center. <laughs> uh, and yet it has uh, infinite ability to learn new things. And so if you looked at them and just asked, what is the intelligence of these things? Well, it's it's uh, it's uh, the wrong question. You say, which one of these has more knowledge? Well, at the beginning it would be the data center. But which one of these has more knowledge creating ability? The baby. And that ends up being decisive. I see. So, um... Have you found GPT-4 or other current AI models at all useful for your AGI research? Last week, I interviewed Greg Fodor, and he talked about how he believes that in order for AGI research to progress, AI researchers need to have access to foundation models because that is like the single most helpful tool for AI research to progress. So do you have a similar or different idea on that? Uh, well, in line with my previous kind of answer, I don't really do anything computational. So to me, it would only be helpful in the usual ways. It would be helpful to like any researcher. Um, in that case, it could be useful. I, I haven't actually been using it. Uh, maybe I should be, but I'd be using it yeah, purely as a ordinary researcher, not as a AGI researcher in particular. Do you have a ChatGPT Plus subscription? No, I just have like uh, some basic, uh, basic one or whatever. I, I don't use it that often. I, I've mostly, mostly used it so far for like wordplay. <laughs> I'll ask it like, uh, can you give me a word that starts with P that means something like rain or what, whatever it is? You know, uh, it's good at that kind of stuff. It's good at many things, and I'm probably the least expert in them. I have a friend who like is trying to get into programming, and so he's using it much more intensely than I am. Um, but yeah, yeah, I study computer science in school, so I find it immensely helpful for learning. Though on the topic of conjecture, like when I'm working on actual projects, something that hasn't been done before, exactly like what I'm trying to do it does fail in surprising ways sometimes, even a system as advanced as GPT-4. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's interesting to note is that uh, if you're like judging GPT or some system like that, uh, you, maybe there are like two broad ways you could judge it. Like one of them is like, how well does it know what is known? And then the second thing might be to say, how well it can, can it solve unsolved problems. And um, I think we sort of underappreciate how often we solve unsolved problems in the course of everyday life, um, just in a way that is uh, almost second nature to us. You know, we'll be asking like, where are the keys? And we'll find the keys and we'll carry on with our day, not realizing that we have just conducted kind of a, a quite sophisticated search program um, in the midst of our ordinary moving around. So I think when you look at uh, the space of possible solutions to problems that we confront, it's huge, and uh, I think this is where maybe GPT shines less, uh, because it's one thing to know what is known or to have text about what is known. Um, it's quite a different thing to be able to use that uh, to solve new problems. And uh, you know, however many trillions of things have been discovered, that's really uh, an infinitesimal part of what we can discover and of the search space that we're involved in every time we try to solve a hard problem. Uh, so when you ask, can GPT do something plausible in some case, the answer is probably going to be yes. But if you ask, can it find the actual solution? 
to some problem in some vast search space that we don't know the answer yet. Well, uh, that takes a special kind of program. And you know, that, that's one half of my book. You know, it's partly about universality, all the things that are possible for a system to do. And then secondly, if you have a search space, how efficiently can you search it? Because the search spaces that we're involved with in ordinary human problem solving are exponential, they're, they're, they're huge. So being able to actually navigate them usefully is an incredible challenge. I think that that's where you see a real difference between different kinds of search processes, GPT being much inferior to the human one. So if you think GPT is necessarily limited compared to humans, how far do you think the current paradigm can go? What do you think will be, you know, the, the capabilities of GPT-5, GPT-6? What will it be able to do relative to humans? I don't know. Uh, that, that's where, like, uh, that's an issue about like, machine learning that I think uh, if you ask me, what could humans do? Uh, well, rather, like, hmm. Yeah, I don't think I have any particular insight into like what any particular technology can do. All I can say is that I'm interested in the things that uh, distinguish different systems. So I'm interested just in the questions of what is the total range a system can uh, explore? What is like the search space of things it can, it can explore? And then secondly, how does it navigate that space? And so if you saw incredible leaps in the size of the search space that different mo models could explore, that'd be great. Although my fundamental question would be, is it unlimited or not? That's my fundamental question. And um, you know, as to what designers come up with in the coming years, they'll they may surprise me in their answers. But that's the question that I'll be asking. And then second, secondly, it'll be how efficiently does this system navigate the search space? In particular, like what fraction of like new ideas that it comes up with are actually improvements over prior ideas? Because natural, you know, uh, like biological evolution is very bad at that. There's a billion letters in the genome, and it sort of starts switching a few of them at random. You know, so one in a billion uh, chance of being an improvement, let's say. Uh, so it's very bad at coming up with new things that are better. It's easy to come up with new things, but new things that are better, that's the hard part. And so those are the kinds of questions I'll be asking. So what kinds of capabilities do you think you'd have to see in a system for you to say, yeah, this is like a human, this is universal, this can navigate any part of the search space? I don't know if you can test that behaviorally. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you're asking like, can it do this infinite set of things, you can't actually check the infinite set of things. So you have to look more in terms of how it's built. And so I think that, uh, yeah, my goal with my book is to try to see what is it that fundamentally matters and then how do, are those things made achievable in the human case? And I think that'll like give you a clearer picture as to like, if you were to open up the internals of some system, um, you could tell what it could do and what it couldn't do. Um, like if you knew what, uh, if you, like if you, if you knew that Turing completeness was an important feature of the system, um, and then you could open up a CPU to see if it could somehow achieve that result, then you'd be, you might be able to tell, okay, yeah, this system is Turing complete. You were asking a very specific question. Um, you weren't necessarily testing its outputs for different things. Um, so I think it'll be more like that, more about how is this system built rather than uh, what is its behavior? So kind of like if you have a computer made out of crabs, have you heard about the crab computer? Uh, no. It was a thought experiment, or not, not a thought experiment. I believe it was a real experiment done by a team of scientists where they figured out how to move crabs around in such a way that they would actually represent a Turing machine. Okay. And they could get it to like represent basic programs. So, you know, the crab computer, if you have enough crabs, would be universal. But uh, I guess, you know, a, a TV playing the same loop of content over and over again with no option to change its output would not. But the TV could demonstrate something a lot more complex than the crabs in practice. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Uh, you may have to repeat that. I was just thinking to myself as you were saying the crab computer would be universal. I was thinking, well, that's only because it doesn't have enough crabs. With an infinite number of crabs, then I should be good. No, it would uh, be universal with an infinite number of crabs. But if you only have a finite number of crabs, say a million crabs, then you would probably have a pretty hard time running like Google Chrome, especially at acceptable speeds. But yeah. if you have a monitor with a static image of Google Chrome on it, it would demonstrate more you know, outwardly complex behavior than the crabs, but it would not be universal in the same way that the crabs are. 
I should know that there's kind of the uh, fundamental point there about this uh, crab computer and, and that kind of thing, which is that uh, there's um, there is no such thing as a universal like Turing machine like in physical reality. If we're always making the the statement that like it's not universal, it doesn't have an infinite uh, resources. Like so, so every machine is going to be finite um, at any given time. But the question is like, can you extend it? Uh, that'll be the really fundamental question. And so I think if you put like a computer someplace and there's no humans around, um, then the capacity of that system is fixed at whatever its starting point was. But if there are humans around or something, or in the case of humans, like if there is a system that itself has the knowledge to acquire more resources and turn them into more memory and more computational power, then that system itself will be able to extend itself. And uh, at that point, at any, it'll still be finite in its computational capacity at any given moment, but into the future, and there'll be no limits on the size of its capacity. And I think that's a, an important point. So if the crab computer requires an external person to add more crabs, then it's not as impressive. But if it itself has a knowledge, as I think the human civilization does, to go out and acquire more resources, uh, well, then if we consider ourselves the big crab computer, the big human computer, we're able to get more uh, non-crab materials from the world and turn that into uh, what we want. Um, that actually is, is a fundamental thing because there are no infinite computers in reality. Um, there are only finite ones, but some of them know how to make themselves bigger and it makes all the difference. So there's no infinity, only a beginning of infinity? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get a moment anyway. Yeah. So speaking of which, on a slight tangent, on the header of your Twitter profile, X profile, you have yes. five books. You have The Logic of Scientific Discovery by Karl Popper, The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins, The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, Gödel Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter, and Knowledge and Decisions by Thomas Sowell. Personally, I've only read Beginning of Infinity, but the other four are certainly on my list to read in the near future. So how did you find these books and how did they influence you? Uh, so I read The Beginning of Infinity first. I found that through Sam Harris. Um, he actually, ironically, had posted it on his website like in 2012 as uh, something he was currently reading. And then I read it. And then like two years later, he had David Deutsch on his podcast. And in his preface, he said, by the way, I apologize. I haven't read your book yet. So <laughs> I had uh, gotten the book from him, then read it, and then finished it before him, I guess. But uh, that introduced me to Popper. And um, I guess I had known about Dawkins beforehand, but only started reading his stuff more recently. Um, and uh, yeah, go to watch your book. I've heard about and uh, I still haven't read it entirely. I read like half of it. Um, I find that like incidentally, a lot of the things in there are uh, like the right kinds of questions to ask. Although I sometimes, I guess, mostly disagree about the answers, like in light of Popper and Deutsch, um, but they're always interesting. And then uh, Thomas Sowell, I was always binge watching Milton Friedman in uh, in college, all his videos, and uh, so naturally came across Thomas Sowell and liked his stuff. And um, I especially liked just. Uh, the title of an essay from like a uh, Friedrich Hayek about the use of knowledge in society and um, an argument being that knowledge is distributed across society and capitalist systems make better use of it. Free market systems make better use of it. And so Thomas Sowell also took this knowledge based view of different economic systems. And I haven't actually read the, in the entire book. I just really loved like the intro to the book more than anything. Uh, just the idea of saying Everybody looks at this at the, the question of like communism versus uh, socialism versus free markets through a very ideological lens um, or even an economic lens. But you could take a look purely uh, at like a knowledge based view. I thought oh, that's very interesting. It's a different level of abstraction. So I, I like to almost think of um, replacing the whole word of epistemology, which is like a mouthful, with more of a with this more pleasant to the ear, uh, the knowledge based view. Um, you know, so I almost think of it like goggles you can put on and suddenly you're looking at your iPhone or your computer or other people around you or civilization. And instead of seeing the atoms, you're seeing the knowledge. And uh, how did it, you ask questions like, how did it get there? Uh, what is its uh, capability? Like what kinds of things does, does it affect, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I find that that's quite uh, nice. And uh, I actually found it practical when I was like talking to people who weren't philosophy nerds. I thought, do I really want to say the word epistemology right now? Like at this pool party, whatever it is. And uh, I thought I'll use the word knowledge-based view, and uh, that felt better. So, so on the topic of Soul and Hayek, who I I think are both fantastic, love both of them. Um, a lot of people seem to kind of assume just 
implicitly that once we get AGI or ASI, whatever that means, then humanity will be, you know, in a utopian communist paradise for all eternity. And the AGI and its infinite wisdom and goodness will simply decide what resources to allocate to whom. So I'm somewhat skeptical of that view. So what do you think about it? I think like, uh, I guess one, one question to ask is, yeah, like, well, what fundamentally changes in, in a system like that? So uh, do you introduce any kind of new thing? Does it, does it change like the fundamental problem? I guess like the fundamental problem in uh, economics in that case is like, if knowledge is distributed and people are creating new knowledge everywhere, then are you able to predict that and then make decisions or not? Um, and so if you have like more powerful computers, then would people be doing more powerful things, less predictable things all throughout the economy? Um, so if you were trying to ask like, how predictable is the economy? Um, if it only consisted of like a very simple system, then maybe you could conceivably model the entire thing in terms of its atoms and everything else and figure out what it, what it would do. Uh, but if the entire rest of the economy is like many, many times more complex than your ability to like simulate it, uh, then it seems like that fact hasn't changed. Um, yeah. That kind of reminds me of an idea from Stephen Wolfram, where he talks about computational irreducibility. So Wolfram is kind of like Deutsch in that he is very into computing computers and taking a computational view of everything. Unlike Deutsch, he emphasizes something slightly different. So whereas David Deutsch talks about humans are universal, right? We can do anything in theory. Wolfram talks more about how humans are computationally bounded observers and how the world as a whole is computationally irreducible. The only way that we can understand complex systems is by observing them. They're very hard to compute. So I wonder if the economy would be totally computationally irreducible. Like the only way to allocate resources efficiently would be to let capitalism just do its thing. Is it even possible in theory to have an AI advanced enough, a computer powerful enough to model the whole thing? Yeah. Isn't this like a Newcomb's paradox or something like that? Or like Newcomb's problem? I think, uh, like, can you predict what a human will do? And I guess the only way to do it was like actually simulate them. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, um, I think that there's interesting things to say about predictability because it might be that if you were to say that like complex systems are unpredictable and you can only run them to figure out what they're going to do, uh, you could say, well, isn't the universe such a system? Uh, but you'd be wrong in that case because there are all sorts of regularities in nature that can be exploited and discovered and, ex and exploited. So if you were to say like, uh, Let's just, uh, all we have to do, uh, our only recourse, if we want to understand the system, is simulate all its atoms and then run it. Um, actually, you'd be missing out on the fact that, let's say, like they're all going to obey like conservation momentum and other things like that. Um, and so, like, no matter, like, so without running anything, I would tell you the total amount of energy or momentum in the system will be the same into the indefinite future. I haven't done any computations just because I, I know this deeper principle. Um, so I would be, in other words, predicting something important, um, even if I wasn't predicting the details. So I think that that's, there are many patterns in reality to be discovered like that. So it's, it's not purely just run it and we can't say anything else about it. He does talk about pockets, reducible pockets in the computationally irreducible universe. So yeah, conservation of momentum and laws of physics is an irreducible pocket, but something like trying to describe, is there a law that you can come up with to describe the 50th step in an arbitrary computational automaton. And Wolfram would say, no, the only way to figure it out would be by running it. So could there be a law that allows us to predict the behavior of systems like that? Oh, it's possible. I wonder what it would take to discover. I think uh, on some level, it's important to like, recognize different levels of abstraction. Um, and so in some cases, you like you just may not care about the low level details. You could say like, it's impossible to predict the location of like this particular atom in the indefinite future. Um, and yet that might be the most boring thing to ask. So uh, at a higher level, it might be that things are quite predictable. Um, you know, if I said like, you know, I, I don't know, something like simple, like you know, I'm just gonna write, write a loop in Python and I'm just gonna add two plus two indefinitely. Uh, so two plus two equals four, I'm just gonna keep reproducing that computation. And so at that level, it'd be perfect, 
perfectly predictable. But then if you're like, tell me what the electrons are doing in the CPU, like that might always look different. Uh, the memory locations being used might always be different. There might be all kinds of incidental complexity that you just wouldn't care about. And um, you might say, ah, that's all computationally irreducible. Um, but then you'd say, well, okay. <laughs> but uh, at a higher level of abstraction, it's perfectly simple. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure what we should take away from the idea of computational irreducibility. Um, I'm sort of more a fan of Deutsch's point about, uh, David Deutsch's point about just the unpredictability of future knowledge, uh, because oh, that highlights sure. the difference between some systems which are very predictable, like this two plus two equals four, or, you know, whatever, that kind of thing, uh, certain kinds of physical laws, and people and what they're doing. Uh, so I think there are other systems that would be computationally irreducible, perhaps, but also very boring, like just some kind of noise product production system. Uh, so aside from these five books, Popper, Dawkins, Deutsch, Hofstadter, and Soul, their books, what other books do you think had a large influence on you? Mm, let me look around the room here. Let's see here. By the way, you should really post a list of all these books on Substack or Twitter, unless you have already. And I haven't seen uh, I guess the best I've done so far is I've just put that uh, thing at the top of my profile. So, uh, but uh, yeah. yeah. No, I think that, uh, I'd say like the biggest book, really, uh, like the 90% of the way I think is The uh, Beginning of Infinity. And then uh, that introduced me to Popper and other stuff, which is uh, fairly interesting. Uh, everything else is helpful to like some extent and like gives some ideas and, you know, lots of things are interesting. So I'd say that like the reason I'm doing all the research I'm doing right now was because of The Beginning of Infinity, like, very directly, um, and uh, Deutsch's essays on AGI. Um, he has an excellent one in uh, Eon Magazine about uh, why Popper is relevant to AGI. So that, that kind of stuff is what really got the ball rolling for me and introduced me to this, this whole area. I never would have gotten interested in Popper otherwise. Um, and then everything else, I would say, at the, at the B level of interest are sort of Popper's books and other things. And then there's just like all sorts of books that I forget the names of at the C level, which are, are interesting in various ways for one or two ideas. Um, and so those I can't really recall, but uh, yeah. But like one of them, for instance, I guess uh, was like a book from like Minsky called uh, Infinite or Finite and Infinite Machines. Um, that was kind of an interesting one. It's probably outdated at this point in some ways. Uh, people have probably invented better ways to explain the fundamentals of uh, computability and so on. But that was still interesting to kind of grapple with low level details of like what people were initially figuring out, what can computers do? How should we think about them? Um, that was cool to kind of uh, go to that deep level. Yeah. So Deutsch and Popper have one epistemology and a rival epistemology that is favored by a lot of people on our part of Twitter and on the internet at large and in the AI community is the rationalism developed by Eliezer Yudkowsky. So rationalism which was developed by Yudkowsky and explained on his website Less Wrong heavily emphasizes Bayes' theorem as essentially the central mechanism of knowledge. Basically, in rationalism, what we do is you have evidence from the outside world that will cause you to update your prior probabilities in one direction or the other. Everything is very mathy. And that seems like it's in opposition to a lot of Deutsch and Popper's ideas. And Deutsch has written about this. He wrote an article called The Simple Reputation of the Bayesian Philosophy of Science, where he kind of destroys the whole idea, I think. So do you think that there are any idea or any areas where Bayes' theorem is applicable? Uh, I'm not really an expert on it. Um, so maybe there uh, is value there that I'm missing, uh, both in like the formal ideas and in the ideas of uh, the broader community and so on. But like, for me, I'm mostly just interested in, in how the mind works. And I think the fundamental questions there are like pop popper's questions. Like, uh, like, how do you come up with new ideas? And then how do you select among them? I, I feel like whenever I tell people uh, or talk about like the fundamental ideas of variation selection, uh, there's like never any pushback. I think that there's just seem like logically obvious. Like um, if you're interested in knowledge creation, it's like, first of all, like you have some things that, you, that exist right now. And then if you need to have a, a new idea, it's going to be produced by existing ones in some form. You, you know, Non-existent things can't just come out of nowhere. So, like, you can have what you do have now, you can reassemble it somehow, you can come up with a new thing, and you can do that in better and worse ways. 
So that's just one thing. So it's like a logical necessity. If you want something better, you have to come up with something new. Um, and you have to have some process that can come up with new things. And then secondly, if you have a bunch of new things you're coming up with all the time, eventually you run out of resources to explore them unless you start removing the ones uh, that aren't good. And so that you can focus on improving uh, prior improvements uh, if you want to have cumulative progress. So you need these variation and selection elements. And then it's just a matter of saying, okay, well, there are better and worse ways of doing these things. Um, that's where the discussion then, then goes to. Uh, so if in the Bayesian case, you might say, do they have a better way of creating new ideas or a better way of selecting among ideas? And those would be my main questions. So do you think that there's any room to say, oh, I find that this theory or this trait uh, has a 70% chance of being correct, and this one has a 30% chance of being correct. So until we get more evidence, we should favor theory A. Basically, is there any room for numbers and probabilities, or is the process of selecting better theories purely ordinal and not cardinal? Uh, what's the difference there? Ordinal meaning you can only compare which one's better and which one's worse. Cardinal meaning you can assign specific numbers, values. So you could say this theory is 90% correct my, or 90% likely to be correct based on my priors, and this theory is 70% likely to be correct. Uh, I mean, uh, I guess the short answer is if it floats your boat, it helps you out, use it. Um, <laughs> so if, uh, but that's a, sort of just a practical thing, I suppose, rather than saying like there's some fundamental importance to their probabilities. Um, you know, it, this is not an answer to your question, but it just reminds me of like the, like the price system. And like there is a value in the fact that like there's all kinds of knowledge that is relevant um, to a given product but not expressed in the price. The price is a simple number and thank goodness for that because it makes it easy to communicate uh, what to do with that object or whatever, that, that product um, in a way that it is sensitive to lots of other knowledge, but you don't have to have all that knowledge explicitly represented to make use of it. So to the extent that you can do useful things like that, then fine. Um, I don't know if there's any fundamental importance to uh, probabilities and so on for epistemology though. Because um, again, uh, to, to me, I guess uh, maybe throw the question back to you and see if you have any thoughts on it. Like, do they help either in the creation of new theories or in the selecting between theories? Um, I suppose you could say, like, if you prefer one theory, you could give it a higher number. But to me, I suspect that, like, there are independent reasons uh, that cause those numbers to be what they are. So, like, I will first say to you, this theory has these problems and seems to be inconsistent with these things. Uh, so that seems to be against that theory. And I'd say this theory doesn't have those problems, maybe it has different problems. And because of that discussion, I might then say, if I had to put it to a vote now, I'd prefer this one, but you know, they both have their problems. So because I'm gonna prefer this one, I'll give that 60%, I'll give this other one 40% or whatever. Um, but you see the order in which those things were arrived at. You know, first the ideas, first the problems with those theories, then I assign some number, for a practical purpose. That's how I'd be thinking about that. That's not using the actual probability calculus or anything. Yeah, I mean, I think that a, a lot of the problems in Bayesian rationalism are just taking their probabilities too seriously because really what they are are wild guesses based on some amount of knowledge and prior uh, probabilities. But like, for example, the whole LK99 superconductor saga, they had their prediction markets and people were really, really trusting these prediction markets as almost like arbiters of truth. You know, they would decide whether or not the superconductor was real based on prediction markets that would swing wildly. If you remember one day they were at like 20% and then the next day they were up past 50%, 60%. People were saying, oh, my my prior or my probability that the superconductor is real is 99%. And now they're back down to five, 10%. So yeah, I think that the usefulness of Bayesianism is limited along with the information that you have. So on the mm -hmm. topic of AGI, you seem to be an optimist when it comes to the conventional question of like, will AI kill us all? So can you explain why you believe that it won't? I guess the, the short answer is that uh, I, I like uh, one of Deutsch's points on uh, on this that the, the battle between good and bad ideas will like rage on um between I, I think good and evil ideas that will rage on like no matter the hardware it's running on 
Um, you know, so like uh, the the real thing is about the quality of our ideas, and I think we should have reason to hope that um, like the culture we've already developed over several hundred years uh, through the Enlightenment has been entirely about or largely about how to coexist peacefully. Um, and so when you place up against um, or when we ask the question like, what does it take to like coexist safely with other creative beings? Um, that's what kind of what we've been working on with our whole project of democracy and so on. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's sort of naive to imagine that it will create beings as good as us uh, or with the same capabilities as us or greater ones uh, in terms of their hardware, let's say. Uh, and then we will somehow uh, deal with that in some kind of technological way rather than like in a cultural way. Um, so I think that uh, our greatest resource in terms of safety dealing with other people is our current institutions and culture, uh, which make me like not want to murder you, for instance, you know, just doesn't really come up as a great idea uh, to solve my problems. Uh, that's a different question from sort of algorithms run amok that aren't uh, universal like us. Like their whole problem is that they're too stupid uh, in the relevant ways uh, to have the right moral uh, knowledge and so on. Um, but if it's universal, then it should have the same capability that we do to not only learn technological things, but moral things. So that kind of runs into an issue that's brought up by Eliezer Yudkowsky and originally developed by Nick Bostrom called the orthogonality thesis, where for the audience who may not know, they're basically saying that the intelligence of a system and the morality of a system are totally unrelated. Not just the morality, but the goals of a system. So for example, it's possible to create an incredibly intelligent AI system, according to Yudkowsky and Bostrom, that wants the goal of nothing more than to make as many paper clips as possible. So do you think that that is likely or not, and why? Like to me, I guess uh, it comes down to like one kind of question you can ask in such a case is uh, this idea that we want to like maximize paper clips. What role does that idea play in this larger AGI system? Uh, we're imagining, I think, often that it forms like the core, this immutable core, which drives everything else. Everything else is subsidiary to that one idea. And if it is nice to you on one day, that is because in its calculations, that will be better for achieving this ultimate goal, which never changes. Um, and so that's one picture of like the role an idea can play in one mind, that it's immutable, central, everything else is subservient to that. Um, I think a different picture is more of like this ecosystem view where, you know, if you drew a circle and your mind was the circle, lots of ideas are vying for power within that system, but there's nothing immutable there. And so if one day that idea arises in your head that you should create paper clips, uh, that will never be in your instantiated in your brain so that like everything else is subservient to that. Or if it does, maybe that would be like what Deutsch calls an anti-rational mean, where uh, it's somehow evolved to, to have that property. But I think people will assume that's easy, but uh, throughout history, it's quite hard to produce an idea that sticks in people's brains and makes everything else subservient to that. Um, so I think that these are like two fundamentally different pictures of what minds are. In one case, you almost have like this image of traditional neural network and uh, machine learning algorithms where it's like an optimization loop which is fixed on the outside. It says, here's the thing we're trying to do. This is our ultimate goal. Everything else is going to be in service of that. And there's nothing in the system that can change that external goal, except an external program. So there's nothing inside the system that can do it. Whereas I think in human minds, it's like I said before, it's like this ecosystem where many ideas are vying for impact and power, and none of them has a, mon uh, a monopoly on it. And that there is no outer loop. Uh, so another way, by the way, you could put this is that if you had a system that has an optimizer, that has a function there. You can always wrap it in another loop with another goal on the outside of that, but there's always going to be an outer loop which can't be changed. And um, in a system that's more of this ecosystem type of view where everything is equal and bouncing around and trying to affect everything else, uh, there is no outer loop. Uh, you have escaped that infinite regress. So another thesis that's brought up by Yukowski and Bostrom is the idea of instrumental convergence. So they believe that no matter what final goal you give an AI, like if you tell it to, you know, cure cancer, or if you tell it to make paper clips, it will converge on the same instrumental strategies, like preserving itself, trying to acquire resources, trying to enhance its intelligence, 
and trying to defend against people shutting it off or changing its goals. And with AI systems that are stronger than humans, supposedly that could be very, very dangerous. So what do you think about the instrumental convergence idea? So the idea is that it converges on certain things, but it diverges on others, right? Yeah, basically, no matter what final goal you give an AI, it will converge on instrumental goals that involve preserving itself and preserving its final goal at all costs. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, you, you can't do anything if you can't survive to do it long enough to do it. So uh, there are certain requirements that uh, like physical reality imposes on you. Like uh, if you want to do anything big, you need a certain amount of energy and so on. So uh, if the system doesn't realize that fact, then so much the worse for that and it won't achieve those goals. Um, so there are certain things, I guess you would say in that case that are predictable prerequisites for achieving many things. Um, so I, I imagine like if it didn't have universal computers, you'd say like, well, probably if it's going to be successful, at least we'll have to invent universal computers because we know how important those are. Um, but that's more, that's less a statement about any kind of, um, at least what you just said anyway, is like less a statement about AGIs or anything in particular, just more about the like causal relationships between different kinds of like, like almost like there was like the technology stack people talk about when we like, if you imagine like starting from being a pre uh, historic human, like the certain things you want to achieve in a certain order in order to get to where we are now. It's more a statement about that sort of logical structure or the causal structure of technologies and so on. Uh, and that which anything would have to adhere to. Another crux of the AI doom argument is that AI systems will become vastly more powerful than humans or even slightly more powerful than humans, and they'll somehow be able to exploit that uh, asymmetry in order to end up killing all of us. Uh, so you've talked about uh, humans are universal, and we can't be replaced by AI systems. Um, Gwern Bronwyn, an internet writer, wrote a long essay called Complexity No Bar to AI, where he argues that even if humans and AIs are both universal in theory, the AIs will run on such better hardware or be able to implement such better algorithms that they would be able to become inconceivably powerful anyway, even if we're both theoretically in the same computability class. So what do you think about that? I think there are different kinds of universality. Um, so one is computational universality, but I think there are a few others, which I have in a, another video. And uh, well, ultimately I think, um, how to put it. Uh, yeah, we, we don't like literally have complexity classes uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of what our thinking is, is about. Um, we don't have like simple algorithms which we're executing on different kinds of inputs. There, but the, the, the core concern of complexity theory about like the resources used for computations, like that, that is absolutely essential in our case. It's not. It just isn't literally about complexity classes. Um, and so I think uh, the answer in those cases is, yeah, like how efficiently do you navigate the space of ideas? And that consists primarily of two questions. How efficiently do you come up with new ideas that are actually good? And then how efficiently can you filter the good ideas from the bad ones? And I think um, two forms of universality, or there, there are forms of universality associated with, with each of those. So if I said to you, I have a method for generating new ideas. You know, I have some ideas here. I have some ways in which I can combine them. Um, and, you know, for instance, uh, like a genome, you know, it consists of letters and you can flip the letters. Have I told you all you can do to create a new mutation is to flip one letter. That's a certain way of navigating the space of genomes. Um, but uh, if that was the only way you could ever use, then you'd be kind of, it would be the equivalent of like only being able to like navigate the planet by taking one step at a time on your feet. Like no planes, no boats, no uh, parasailing or anything like that, just your feet. And that would be quite a slow way to navigate the space of ideas. Um, whereas we can continually invent new ideas, new ways of combining them that are the equivalent, if we're thinking of navigating the globe, of taking a plane someplace. Um, my favorite example of this is uh, a video called Pakistan Goes Metal. <laughs> which in a sense combines only two things, uh, traditional Pakistani music and metal music. Um, this is not uh, a low level combination. This is a combination of two very high level concepts that makes it seem very easy, 
And yet when you combine these two things, there are many lower level details uh, below them. But at this level of abstraction, the combination is very simple. Um, there was a time before Pakistan existed, the time before metal music existed. Um, and those concepts had to be invented. And um, now that we have them, they allow us to form very simple, but very powerful combinations. And I think of that as saying, basically, we have invented new ways of combining things. Um, if you thought only in terms of notes, you could, it would take thousands of things to express the difference between this Pakistan goes metal thing, uh, or rather to express this idea of Pakistan plus metal and purely in terms of notes would be very complicated. Uh, you know, you have to look at the MIDI file, it would be hundreds of different things that you have to tweak. Um, so in other words, there's a simple way of combining new things and that is essential for us to actually be able to efficiently create new ideas that are better. Um, and there's analogous things for uh, our ability to select among options and tell which ones are good. But yeah, the, the, the bottom line of all that is if you can't invent new ways, like this Pakistan goes metal, new, new concepts, new ways of generating new ideas, uh, then you're going to be hopelessly inefficient. You're going to be like the person trying to navigate the planet on their feet rather than with planes. So back to the current paradigm of AI, where we have neural networks with tremendous amounts of data and tremendous amounts of compute. Do you think that there's a possibility that simply adding more will lead to uh, conjecture and universality in the same way that evolution, which is kind of a dumb process, you know, there is nothing really intelligent guiding it other than it navigating the search space. Evolution led to human universality. So do you think that there's some point at which we add just enough compute so that AIs will become universal? I guess there's like two questions. I guess this isn't quite your question, but uh, if you add more uh, computational power to a system with, which is like less efficient, like exponentially less efficient, then it doesn't really matter how much more power you add to a system. So that's more of this computational class type idea um, where it's like, if you have a really bad algorithm for doing something, it doesn't really matter what constant you add in, in front. Uh, but that's, I think, not what you're asking. Um, I guess your question is more about almost like that uh, instrumental convergence idea. It's like, well, if you have evolution doing its thing over here, you have machine learning do its, its, doing its thing over here, and one of them ended up discovering a path to us, uh, to this uh, universal kind of algorithm, uh, would the other do the same as well? Um, like, is this somewhere along the path of doing really anything impressive? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's more a question for people designing uh, designing um, objective functions and so on. Um, I suspect that the set of possibilities of like possible algorithms is like so large that like actually converging into things that we do is uh, is not so easy. Um, but like you said, like evolution did it, so maybe uh, there's a way of getting uh, machine learning to do it too. Yeah, one of the might not know why it's doing it at the time. That's true. Yeah, and. Clearly, AIs are able to do some things that seem impressive that we're not yet able to explain, like writing code and writing poetry and writing math. And of course, nothing that it's done yet is close to the level of the best humans, but it's been able to do some pretty impressive things just from having the amount of data and compute that it does. Yeah, I think it's uh, so. So, one thing that gets asked on Twitter a lot is like, can uh, machine learning algorithms do X or like, can they explain things or whatever? Um, I think that's, uh, again, if I think about like my two fundamental questions about universality and efficiency, like what can the system do in principle, given infinite resources, and then how efficiently can it do things? Uh, those are the two questions that I think about. Um, it may then be the case that machine learning algorithm, algorithm, maybe it could do anything given not the right amount of time. Like if it's exploring the space of programs, and it doesn't have any obvious limit to which programs it can come up with, then that means like any kind of program it could come up with. Um, then it's just a matter of like, can it come up with like the right ones efficiently? So like, one way to think of this question is like, what would it take for a machine learning system to come up with like general relativity? Because that's a quite particular computation, it's a particular idea. And in the space of all ideas, you know, it's this one spec. So how do you find that needle in that haystack? Um, I, I might say, uh, the machine learning system could do it. Like if it can find any program, like you know, a random program generator can generate any program. So it could generate relativity. Uh, but uh, finding that needle in the haystack by accident is going to be an unlikely thing. So then the question is, how long would it take for a machine learning, machine learning system to do that? Um, 
and would it even recognize that it had found the right answer if it stumbled across it? So those are the things I'd be asking. So I guess the difference is certain people like the people at OpenAI, Sam Altman, for example, once famously said, gradient descent can do it. So he believes that simply adding more and more and more computing power and giving the model more and more and more knowledge will eventually cause it to either to awaken or simply to know so much that it approximates a universal being like a human. While you think that, no, it doesn't matter. Like the search space is just too big. You can't put all of it into a model. It needs to be able to explore it by itself. Like the baby versus the data center. Yeah, I, I think like gradients are an attempt to solve the same uh, efficiency problem. Like when you're navigating a huge space, you could try to train a, like a modern neural network via evolutionary methods. Um, you could say, here's all the weights. Let's try a small permutation of the weights, see which ones are better, choose those, move on to the next. But the problem is that that's like vastly more computationally intense than using gradients, which tell you exactly where to go to get the next improvement. Um, so the, the efficiency is still the relevant thing. Um, but the limitation fa limiting factor is like, can you uh, get a gradient for your situation? You know, in all these cases, you're trying to assemble a mathematical system which is similar enough to the actual thing you care about that, but also has a property that you have like the full mathematics of how it works and can therefore navigate it. But that's not a given. Yeah, it is interesting that Naval Ravikant agreed with you a couple of years ago. He wrote an article called More Compute Power Doesn't Produce AGI. And someone responded to him recently saying, wow, this Naval guy really missed the mark on AI. And he said, Naval, we don't have AGI yet, but GPT-4 has definitely caused me to update my priors. So consider that piece obsolete while we all learn more. So do you think that before versus after GPT-4 at all, or GPT-3.5, ChatGPT even, have your ideas on this changed at all? Or are you still, you know, there's, you know, compute can't do it without algorithms? Uh, yeah, I think this is back to the same point I said before about like, uh, this is where the analogy with complexity theory, like it makes more sense where adding a constant factor doesn't change the scaling factor. Uh, and so if you say like the, or I guess maybe the better way to put it is, um, g given the size of the search space we're dealing with the space of all pop like ideas, it's like an infinite space. Uh, so like navigating that efficiently is hard. If you have like a machine that can do things a million times faster, that's almost no help if it doesn't have uh, a fundamentally good way of navigating that space. It's like saying, I have a system which can like search every grain of sand individually uh, to find uh, something buried someplace, where it's like actually you would want a high level theory that could tell you like it couldn't possibly be here, it couldn't possibly be there. So with the right kinds of ideas, you can eliminate infinite swaths of the search space without ever checking them individually. Um, so there are far better and worse ways to navigate the space of ideas. Um, and so it's really important that you have that. Um, but uh, more broadly, I, I just am curious not so much about like particular systems. Um, I'm curious about like the full spectrum of sort of knowledge creating systems. I like to think of it as like comparative epistemology. Uh, you know, so if I'm asking these questions about universality and efficiency, about variation and selection, these are the universal questions which apply both to genetic evolution to any given algorithm, to human minds, to animal minds, to everything. Um, so any given point in that spectrum, I'm interested in to shed light on the rest of the spectrum. Because there are things uh, with GPT, which I would say like, it's not that I think it's AGI, but I do think it shows you another interesting point on the spectrum of knowledge creating systems that didn't exist before. So that's what makes me interested in it. Um, as opposed to saying this will be, this either is or will be uh, an early successor or uh, an ancestor of an AGI system. So speaking of GPT-4, you talk about looking into different knowledge creating systems and how that's very interesting. So one such thing where people are looking into knowledge creating systems is mechanistic interpretability, where AI researchers are looking into the weights and biases of neural networks like GPT-4 and seeing if they can figure out what internal algorithms, internal circuitry it uses to do stuff like adding numbers or deciding uh, what words to use for poetry or whatever it does in there. So do you think that mechanistic interpretability is interesting and or useful? 
Yeah, I like it. Uh, I haven't gotten too deep into it, but I like the idea that it, the picture that I, I have when I see it is that something like GPT-4 is this large computational system and that the way it evolves is such that certain kinds of computations can arise within it, such as general algorithms for adding or doing different things like that. And so I, I like the idea that it, it shows that, yeah, for potentially arbitrary programs can arise in the system. It's hard to predict which kinds of programs will arise in it. Um, but, uh, and, and then the question becomes like, okay, what, what kinds of things can arise within the system or like how, what, what process, what process can give rise to that and how efficiently. So this comes back again to the idea that like, maybe it can discover relativity, um, but what would it take to do that? Um, how would it distinguish that theory from all the alternative things that might have come across along the way? Why would it then decide on relativity? So I would be surprised to find general rel relativity within that system. I wouldn't say that it's impossible. I would say it'd be interesting to look. And my question would be about, yeah, like what is it, what is it about the human way of thinking that allows us to converge on something like general relativity, or is it's probably very unlikely for something like GPT? Um, though it's not that it's impossible exactly. Um, it's just that uh, I don't think it would be able to distinguish uh, between all the possibilities to settle on that one. Because you know, E equals MC squared is a lot similar to E equals MC to the 2.001. <laughs> um, so yeah. But one is right and the other is wrong. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, I think, um, I don't know a huge amount of physics to go into like the derivations of these things, but I always assume there's a pretty fundamental difference between those things. One is like a very empirical thing. Uh, so yeah, if you put enough zeros on it, you still be asking like, why is there a 0.01? You know, because if you think about, it's a different situation where you have like areas, you know, like I, I can understand very clearly why there'd be a two there, the 2.001, it doesn't quite square with our understanding of like, you know, length times another length gives you the answer. Uh, yeah, it is pretty cool how many like easily human understandable mathematical constructs there are in reality, like what you just mentioned, the area calculation or the area of a circle. You know, pi is not really human understandable. It's an irrational number that goes on forever. But the squared part is, the R part is. Anyway, you wrote a tweet where you said, don't treat digital or biological people like tools that's slavery something along those lines so mm -hmm. with the idea of ai alignment that's becoming more and more popular where depending on who you ask it's either about making ai systems do what we want or making ai systems do things that are safe what do you think about the field of alignment i think i go with uh, david deutsch on the idea that uh, there's a fundamental difference between ais on the one hand and people on the other and so if if the thing is a person, uh, then it's a person. The, the hardware doesn't matter. Um, all the same rights and privileges apply uh, that you and I have. Uh, if it's not a person, it's a tool, then there's almost no ethical concerns at all about like its well-being or something like that. It's just a matter of, does it hurt other people? Um, that's the only ethical matter. So if you say, like I have created some kind of weapon system or something, then I'll be very curious to say, like it's not going to kill me, is it? Uh, <laughs> that's what I care about. But if it's a... Uh, if it's a human, then the, the more important concern is, yeah, like, are you treating it right? Um, and so the idea of like, trying to control its mind in some way other than via persuasion, an ordinary argument, uh, would be, that's where you enter the, uh, is it Orwellian? Uh, I guess Orwell doesn't do a whole lot of uh, actual uh, neurosurgery, but uh, you get the idea. So do you think that there are AGI risks in the future, risks to creating digital people that would be as capable or more capable than biological people? Yeah, I guess it's a matter of just saying like, yeah, like if they are fundamentally the same as us in terms of the way in which they deal with ideas, you know, it's just like the same program as you and me, just, just I guess, basically saying, yeah, like, what if I took your brain and scanned it and then just ran it on fast hardware? What would happen then? Uh, would we all be like subject to your wishes because you had like such an advantage over us? Like how much of an advantage is that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a bit analogous, like the question of like, yeah, like, what happens if like some country gets nukes or like what, you know, what if, if it gains some kind of advantage over us? Um, 
Yeah, and I, I, I'm not uh, that well practiced on uh, geopolitical questions of that sort, so I'm not sure what the best strategy would be. So you're saying kind of that the world is robust enough so that, you know, giving one person, one entity, a big advantage in one area wouldn't just break the universe. Oh, I'm, I'm saying it's, I guess, an open question, I guess. It's like, uh, if we're supposing that we had a system that's basically you, but running on faster hardware, uh, there's an open question, first of all, whether or not, like, you would actually have faster hardware, you know, like, if we ran your brain on current CPUs or something, like, or on, on the best current chips, like, would it actually be, be better? It's not obvious that it would be, um, but suppose it was, how much advantage would that be? Uh, that's an open question. Maybe thirdly, like, what if there are like other uh, competitors to you that also have good hardware? Um, and then again, in, in that case, we'd be running to this idea that David Deutsch said as well, like, you know, the battle between good ideas will, you know, continue regardless of the hardware it's running on. Uh, so then it would be it would be asking more perhaps about like what are the different ideas of all these different fast running AGIs because presumably they won't all agree. Um, so we might be asking a question like that. Uh, I suppose that's what some other like countries like in World War II would be asking about like the Western world. Uh, you know what will what will our war makers decide to do? Because uh, we have all these weapons and you know a great deal more power. So like will we join the war? Will we not join the war? And their fate might be decided by our decisions uh, with those bigger tools. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know about the hardware to know like what advantage it would be to like take your brain right now and run it on today's or tomorrow's hardware, um, and how well dispersed that would be, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or whether or not we'd have like the neural link sort of set up uh, making us faster. So one of your influences is Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, sure. Yeah, it's quite quite a lot less than David Deutsch, but uh, I do find him interesting. Yeah, so Hofstadter recently had an interview, which uh, you may have seen, where you know, over the last few decades, he's been highly skeptical of AI capabilities. He was of the mind that you know the human mind is really complex and it'd be very very hard to write a computer program that could replicate the human mind and whatnot. But in this recent interview, he was like really freaked out about the progress in AI. He talked about being terrified. He thinks about this practically all day, every day. Um, he feels, you know, an inferiority complex to future AI. Like humanity will soon just be utterly surpassed that all of his beliefs prior were wrong. Um, so clearly David Deutsch still has a, a cooler head about this. And I think you agree with Deutsch over Hofstadter. So why do you think that Hofstadter, who's been highly attuned to computing for like decades just suddenly switch i don't know i haven't read his uh his piece so uh it'd be hard to say but i think one thing that i just have in mind is like um i, I think it's just generally underappreciated how hard it is to make progress in reality um i, I just you know like the the, the search space of ideas is this infinite space and finding good solutions like general relativity and things like that within it are so stupendously, like they're so stupendously rare. And by the way, there aren't like simple gradients you can follow to get to them. Um, if you were to think about like, the topology of some search space, like general relativity would like this Eiffel Tower and everything around it would be just flat desert. Like a slight variant of the theory doesn't work at all. Um, so to find these things is, is a stupendous achievement that our minds are capable of, and it seems like nothing else is so far. And so uh, when I see that things are impressive in some ways, like maybe automating things that we've already done, maybe uh, putting together ideas that we already have to some degree, uh, those things can be impressive, but like against like the enormity of the actual search space of ideas, like the actual search processes people routinely go through to, de to define like better neural networks and better uh, engineering solutions, I just find like, like you say, like let, let's actually try to have GPT design, like, like, like do the job of like a real engineer. Uh, I think that when you start to see like, oh, there's so many choices here that we fail to appreciate that are involved in actually doing a good design of something. Uh, how much knowledge is involved? How much? How many options we face all along the way? I think a lot of these systems start to seem much, much weaker. Um, so I think, yeah, my, my starting picture is, the space of possible ideas is vast, and most systems aren't universal. They're they're finite and have no means of extending their capability. 
So there's a there's an infinite difference between finite and infinite. <laughs> so that's one thing. And then secondly, given the search the, the largest the search space, uh, you really have to have just incredible mechanisms for efficiently navigating it. And I think most things just don't have what it takes. And so unless somebody were to appreciate both of those facts, uh, uh, I just don't think that they're really hitting the important issues. And, and by the way, if something does do those things, that's not any reason to uh, be worried about one's own consciousness. I mean, if something kills you, well, that, that's not good. But if something were to have those same properties that our minds already have, they would become equally as good as us in terms of their software. They may have better hardware, but then again, if there's better hardware for them, why not better hardware for you very soon? Uh, in which case you would then resume your status as, as equals. So on the topic of better hardware for humans, is it possible that there's no way for human minds to run on computational substrate without killing you in the upload process? And that's a question for like optics engineers. I, I would not bet against uh, somebody in the future discovering a way of uh, scanning you without hurting you. But even if they did, uh, like if they could just uh, scan all your atoms in one go, and then let's say like they had very good technology for like also replacing your atoms, then like I could be scanning you and then replacing all your atoms like a million times a second. <laughs> uh, like I don't know if that's physically impossible. Uh, and it may be that we actually care about virtual reality more. Um, like you know, it could be that's the reality that we, we actually want to live in where everything is fully designed. Um, in which case I would say, yeah, I don't really care about these atoms. You know, destroy them because uh, I'm going to be living in virtual reality. Um, by the way, like I think the virtual reality people think about now is of course goggles and so on, but I think about virtual reality as being like everything you currently experience, but like maybe a thousand times better, you know, like a 10 dimensional yeah. space you can exist in and, you know, whatever you like about the present reality, I don't think any of that is withheld from you uh, by sufficiently good designers in the future. Yeah, I think of things like the Apple Vision Pro as kind of like V0.0.1 virtual reality. And we are so far from coming out with even like a V0.1, a Neuralink type thing that actually works for very basic tasks for humans. But we'll see, you know, never bet against progress, never bet against the future. It comes faster than you think. But what I meant by my uh, question with uploading minds is let's say you want to upload your brain to run on a computational substrate rather than a biological one. So or I should it, say that they're both computational substrates. One just happens to right. be built different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A silicon substrate, for example. Um, is it possible that somehow consciousness is an inherent to your actual biological neurons and that in the process of moving your synaptic connections or whatever, from one substrate to another that you would die, you subjectively would stop experiencing consciousness and that a copy of you would be in the uploaded form. Yeah, I don't know that we have uh, any good theories on in terms of you know, selfhood and these kinds of things. So like, I don't think about consciousness at all. Um, I think only about like computation and uh, sort of like, uh capability um so i think in terms of you have all this information in your brain it has all this ability to uh, cause other things and then the new system would have all those same properties so that's the thing that leaps out at me as being the most important thing um and that's what you sort of uh so, so yeah you know, and that's the clearest thing to talk about um as far as consciousness and selfhood uh i guess i'll leave that to others i sort of assume like Deutsch does that given how important it seems to be that you have like particular neurons doing particular things. Um, and in other words, uh, if you look at the brain functionally, that seems to be the, the most important perspective on it. Um, in terms of consciousness and other things, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people with this question in particular tend to just go on total gut intuition while we just have no explanation, no theories for any of it. So people will say like, oh, when you go to sleep and you wake up, that's a discontinuity in your consciousness, but you don't die. But if you were to teleport your body, as in if you were to have your atoms disassembled, the information sent to a 3D printer and your body reprinted, that would kill you and create a copy. So say most people, some people. 
Or if you were to upload your mind, then that would kill you and create a copy. Or there's the idea of the Moravec transfer, where instead of just, you know, destroying your brain and sending the data to a computer in one go, you basically have tiny nanobots going through your brain and one by one swapping out your biological neurons with silicon ones or whatever other substrate we find better. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like there's any really fundamental difference between saying like, uh, what if I like zapped all your molecules out of existence right now and I rebuilt them exactly where they were, but like one molecule to the left. Or uh, so, so that being one case, and in the other case, I just like swap out every molecule of your body for the identical but different molecule. I just do them all in order, you know, but it also like I do, I finish the whole thing in a, in a nanosecond. Uh, yeah. So you're saying the consciousness is more of a, more about the pattern than it is about the actual specific atoms or molecules that make up your body? Well, like I said, I don't know anything about consciousness, but if we uh, are just talking about intuitions and so on, uh, it, it might seem bad to be like, we'll just destroy your whole body and then re reproduce another one. And now a second later, uh, but then again, it doesn't seem like there's any fundamental difference between that and like just doing them all one by one, like uh, very quickly. Uh, and certainly, both of these things would be functionally the same. I guess nobody really disputes that. They're saying, okay, well, yeah, if you put me in the computer, it'll say it's me, but it won't be me. Uh, that's the usual re reply. Yeah, I guess there's only one way to find out unless we come up with a good enough theory of consciousness. But I wonder if it's even possible to come up with a good enough theory of consciousness before we have nanotech level technology that can upload our minds into computers. Well, I think that probably like, it might not help at all with the question of consciousness. So it's like, we already exist here. Like you know, if it, you know, if, uh, if our actual existence right now isn't very helpful to this question, it's not clear that uh, some other technology would be helpful either. But uh yeah, I, I think like it, maybe it's like the wrong kind of question. Like, if you were to ask, like, about different species, for instance, like, uh, basically, if we're talking about like discrete differences versus like differences like right, continuous, um, then we'd be comparing, um, or, or rather, let's see, like, the question of whether this copy of you would be you, maybe the wrong sort of question. In the same way that like asking if like. Uh, two species that exist in uh, at different times in like the tree of life are like, uh, like fundamentally different or something because like, they're linked by this small uh, gradual changes throughout. Uh, so at no point was there some grand, grand leap from this to that. Um, and yet they're wildly different. So about three years ago, you wrote an article called A Few Questions on AGI, where you talked about six questions that you had about AGI and related topics. And I'd love to ask you each of those questions now and, and revisit them and see what progress you've made intellectually three years later. So question number one is, what are the limits of biological evolution? Hmm. Yes, yeah, so I guess I would just say that I've framed that more generally perhaps in terms of universality. Uh, so like just asking more generally, given any given, given system, what can it do and what can it never do, despite any question of resources? Um, and I think certain limitations with like biological systems are to do with the fact that like they one of yeah, one of the particular things about them is that they have to obey certain kinds of constraints in every generation. Um, so you, you have to be able to get yourself copied uh, or you know, reproduction has to happen in every generation. Whereas with like human ideas, if you think about the difference between like Newton and Einstein, like Einstein had to create many theories that were nowhere near as good as Newton's to begin with. Like they were no better at prediction. Only his like last published version was as good or better uh, at New as Newton's was in terms of prediction. So if you think about like a graph of like fitness, you'd say like somehow when you go from Newton, which is like high fitness to Einstein, Einstein did all this stuff that was terrible <laughs> for years. And then eventually he did something better. Um, but there was this large gap where he tried lots of things and made many improvements. They just weren't improvements in terms of predictive accuracy. So he had, he had to invent his own new criteria uh, to improve at. And then eventually he did better at, at predictive accuracy. Uh, that's something that evolution couldn't really do because you, at every generation, you would have to be better. Uh, you have to survive according to that one criteria. 
Um, so these are these gaps that evolution can't cross. So that's one kind of limitation that it faces. So on a slight tangent, uh, you talked about prediction, theories being good at prediction. So what do you think is the difference between prediction and explanation? Well, I think um, one thing you could say is that uh, between an, uh, some kind of idea in your head and some system out of reality, uh, that there can be relationships between these two things. Uh, they can have certain kinds of similarity. And so if you say, um, yeah, so, so, so general relativity expresses a certain kind of, or, or, or that mathematical idea, that theory, is similar to actual reality in a very particular kind of way. Um, and that's what explanatory knowledge is all about, is finding, exploiting, uh, and expressing patterns in reality. Um, and I guess predictions are talking maybe less about those like wider scale patterns in reality and more to do with like particular observations that you make about like what you will see, not what reality is like really like, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I suppose I don't think too much about predictions versus explanations, except in terms of like the role in terms of helping you improve your ideas. Um, so, so I think about them. Like a, prediction would be more like the Celtics are likely to win the next NBA finals. And then explanation would be more like the Celtics have better athletes, better coaches, um, better whatever. And thus, they are more likely to win the finals. Yeah, so I guess here, yeah, you, you'd be trying to, uh, yeah, discuss like the actual things in reality and uh, maybe how to give rise to something else. But uh, but by the way, just maybe another tangent here is that um, it, there are different kinds of ideas, um, but there's not there's no such thing as like an explanation per se, like as a, like a particular kind of idea. I think. Um, like if I ask you, like if I say the word banana, like in some contexts that will just be a random concept, and in some cases it would be an explanation. If I if you ask me like why did you go to the grocery store, and I said banana, that would be an explanation of why I had gone. You know, I wanted to get a banana, that's why I went. Uh, but absent that explanatory problem, it's just a it's just a concept. So explanation in some ways is actually more of a role. It's more of a function uh, than anything else. And uh, I often think in terms of like explanatory problems. Um, so if you said like, why did you go to the store? You're, you're saying like, I can imagine many ways, many reasons you would go to the store. I don't know which one of these it is. So can you help tell me which one it is? So you have a certain kind of problem in your head, some kind of gap in your knowledge. Um, you're like, I know a lot of things about the situation, but I just don't know that. And so you're asking, so what is the answer to that? And then I would give you banana. And that'd be the answer. Um, whereas if you had a different explanatory problem, you'd want a different kind of answer. You'd say, uh, that store was really open. Or like, why was the store open? Because uh, you say I went, I told you, yeah, I went there at three in the morning. So, well, I thought that store was closed. It was actually open. Why is that? That's it. I might have an answer for that. Or I would say like, I broke in because I really wanted to ban. Uh, <laughs> uh, try to fill in that gap, whatever that gap happened to be. So question number two, what makes explanatory knowledge special? Yeah, I think... Um, there, I often think about the difference between um, knowledge, which is about like what actually exists, and knowledge that is helpful for action. Because if I told you there was like a system where there was a, uh, let's say, yeah, let's say you're going, you're trying to go from point A to point B, but there's like a big monolith in the way, and to uh, avoid the monolith and get around to the point B, uh, the destination, you could actually have in your head a little rule. Uh, like this is what engineering classes often do, by the way, with like Lego race cars and things. Like you can just program in. Like if you see something dark, turn right, and then turn left or whatever. Um, so you could put in a pretty simple algorithm for dealing with that situation that incorporated no knowledge, no explicit knowledge of that uh, barrier in a way. And yet uh, that knowledge would only be useful in like a, a narrow range of, cir of circumstances. Whereas if I said, ah, there is this particular object in the way, um, you could then use that knowledge not only to avoid it, but to like do any number of other things that you hadn't anticipated ahead of time. Which I think it's kind of interesting. So you might say later on, like, I need a, I need a cube, but th th there's a cube there. And so you would now be able to use that cube in a way that prior you could uh, avoid the cube when that was the relevant thing to do. But now you wouldn't really have any knowledge of the availability of cubes <laughs> around you. Uh, so when you did need one, the fact that there was one there would be ir irrelevant to you. Uh, so I think that's sometimes a, a useful, uh, simple 
uh, explanation of how uh, knowledge is only about action um, can actually be pretty limiting. All right, and question number three, how can Papirian epistemology improve narrow AI algorithms? Well, I think, um, as I mentioned, I, you know, really, really, I just have uh, the two things that I always talk about, universality and efficiency. And so I think that uh, when you see the full spectrum of knowledge creating systems um, and you compare them all in these terms, what is the space, the space that they are searching? Um, what kinds of universality do, do they have? And secondly, how efficiently do they search that space? Um, you can then get ideas, you know, and that's kind of what uh, people have done with like evolutionary algorithms and so on. They've taken some inspiration for evolution for their own algorithms. Um, and so I think with Popper, maybe one of the more important things from him is, uh, you know, he has, he, has, he has some good pithy kind of uh, phrases, one of which is the content of a theory is in what it forbids. And he's most interested in this fact because of testability. You know, if I tell you all swans are white and then you see a black swan, well, that's my theory says there can't be any black swans. So now I can discover there's a problem with the theory. We have something to work out. Uh, so it's relevant to testability, but it's also relevant to efficient search. Because if I say, ah, there's a law of gravity here, and it tells me that if I throw this ball, it will follow a parabola, and uh, that's how it has to go, then I'm implicitly also saying that if I, if my equations say the ball will be here, I'm also say saying it's not going to be anywhere else, which is pretty useful when you want to find the ball, because um, there's an infinite everywhere else. <laughs> that I'm telling you that ball isn't going to be there. Um, so if you think of all of our laws, all our scientific uh, knowledge as being like that, telling you not only what is, but therefore also like what isn't going to be true, um, what things aren't worth searching, uh, then it's actually very useful. Because I know that, for instance, if I'm looking for new scientific theories, I think they will all obey conservation of energy. Well, anytime I find a theory that doesn't obey that principle, I then feel I can probably throw that away, or I know I have to fix it. So that it does obey the principle, uh, that knocks out a hell of a lot of possibilities. Uh, it saves me potentially infinite amounts of time. So I think that to the extent you can incorporate powerful constraints like that into any search algorithm, uh, it's for the best. By the way, on a slight tangent, do you picture the first like true AGI system to resemble more a neural network or resemble more a conventional computer program, like a a, a, a GOF AI, good old fashioned AI, is the term that they use. A simple optimizer or something. Well, I, I don't think. Um, yeah. Well, so so before I kind of mentioned, there's a, a fundamental difference between an optimizer, which has a, like a fixed objective that can't be changed from within the system. That's one kind of thing, and then a system which is more like an ecosystem, where there's no sort of a fixed idea, which everything else must be subservient to. Um, there's an open question as to whether one can simulate the other, in which case maybe that's okay. Um, so if you have a, an optimization function that can within itself simulate this other more ecosystem type of view, um, maybe that would be good enough. Uh, so maybe it's possible to uh, to arrive at the right answer sort of within the neural network sort of system. I guess that's what people usually talk about anyway. They say like, if we, if if logical statements, for instance, are really valuable, do we have to bake them in the beginning or can they be emergent within the system? I guess I suppose that's an open question and uh, probably would bet on it being emergent. You know? it, it's part of the more general question of like, what things do we have to start off with versus what things can emerge later? And ideally for someone who wants to build it, you know, you want it, the core to be very simple so that you don't have to build very much and then it can sort of discover everything important later. So number four is, what are the different kinds of conflicts between ideas? I think I have sort of a, so, so the reason Popper brings that up is that it helps you focus your sort of uh, problem solving in the right place. If you say like, ah, there's a problem between quantum theory and relativity, then you know where to look to make an improvement in physics, uh, making those theories not conflict anymore. And that's true more generally. Uh, so if you know that theory A and theory B don't conflict, don't work together, um, then you can try altering either of them or coming up with new ideas so that you eliminate that conflict. So it gives you a kind of a barometer of progress in a way, um, some, something to meet. Um, 
but I think that uh, those aren't the only things that could help guide your problem solving. So if you, um, so, so I, I like to think more in terms of like attention in a way, like so just what helps you guide your attention to fruitful areas. If you're gonna come up with new ideas and you're gonna start filtering ideas, well, which kinds of new ideas should you come up with? And how should you select among them? And anything that can help you answer those questions and focus your energy into fruitful areas will be good because biological evolution doesn't do that. And it's terribly slow as a result. You know, if you were to try to make an improvement in your ideas at random, uh, you would be combining ideas as different as like giraffes and spaceships. You know, like these are both in your head. You could combine them, but it wouldn't be helpful. So what you actually want is something that tells you, ah, there's a problem here, or there's just something interesting here. And it's all focused on that. Yeah, I think those are definitely good points. I don't think many people think enough about this in particular. Question number five is, why is the brain a network of neurons? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have much to say on that one. Although I did read a paper recently that uh, talked about um, the brain as a Turing machine. Um, and it kind of made the point that uh, something like how, how a fairly small set of neurons um, allowed you to build up simple circuits that had the, the properties you would need to make like a Turing machine. Um, I forget the details of it, but, uh, but yeah, I guess that wouldn't necessarily address the, the fundamental question of like why neurons? Like if Turing machines are important, it's not a given that you should build them out of neurons. So the fact that we did is an open question. So I can't say I made much progress on that question. Yeah, this one's definitely one of the tougher ones. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess it's something that evolution converged on eventually. In the article, you talk about uh, brains are evolvable while modern computers could be designed. So we can, I guess this, this ties into the bigger question of can we design architectures that are better than we are? They, they won't be better in a fundamental sense of like what they can compute uh, and so on, but like they could be better in the sense of ordinary designers, you know, like say, oh, okay, a GPU does X, Y, and Z better than a CPU. Okay. Uh, so it could be better in that sense, uh, just in terms of being faster and more efficient. But, uh, but it wouldn't be a fundamentally different kind of program. Uh, yeah. And then number six is another super interesting one. How does the low level behavior of neurons give rise to high level information processing? Yeah. So I think that that's uh, an area that I have been focused on so much, uh, but like this paper that I mentioned before of like Turing machine within the brain would maybe be like a, uh, a really cool place to look. Cause yeah, lately I've been mostly interested in the higher level questions um, of just like, you know, how do we even distinguish between different kinds of systems um, and like what makes us special? So that, that's that been, that's sort of like a, that question of like demarcation in a way has been uh, the focus of this of late. But uh, whenever I do sometimes dip into like the lower level details, uh, it's interesting. So that, yeah, that's kind of an area that I'm like getting more into lately. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think in some ways the question of like, how do you actually compute stuff is a secondary question. Cause if you don't know what, like what you're trying to compute, uh, then it's not as helpful. Whereas if you know like, oh, Turing completeness is an, important, is an important thing. Well, then we can talk about how you take subunits and get there. But if you don't know the Turing completeness is important, then you're going to be kind of trying to combine units in a way that is kind of aimless. So I think the focus on these high level ideas of universality and efficiency uh, start to tell you what it is that you want to compute. Um, and then you can ask, okay, now how do we actually compute those things with the tools that we've got? Um, but I do think, uh, yeah, I, I'm slowly getting more interested in like lower level details, as I mentioned, like through Minsky and other things to just see, okay, what are the fundamental building blocks of computation? Uh, now that I'm getting a better idea of what we want to compute. So what do you think the fundamental building blocks of computation are? Well, I guess like Minsky talks about different kinds of things and uh, building out of like many different subunits and that sort of things. Um, one of the things I think is interesting, by the way, this doesn't necessarily answer your question, but it's just sort of one of the things that came up when reading about this stuff is that uh, I used to think of like Turing machines as being uh, quite important. Uh, and they're like, of course, historically very important, but then there's a separate question of like, what is their 
uh, how, how should we think about them now? Uh, just in terms of their actual performance and this and that. And of course, people will tell you like, actually computing with Turing machines sucks. <laughs> uh, you don't wanna actually use Turing machines in practice. Um, so I think that it's become clear to me, and maybe this is obvious to everyone, everyone who's already taken like a class in computability or something, but uh, to me, like on the one hand, you have like the space of all possible programs, and that thing is pretty fundamental. Uh, that's like the space of all ideas. And so that, that's there, that's this immutable thing. Uh, that's where all our resources are uh, when it comes to like all the ideas we can ever think. Separately from that, there are machines which can run any of those things. Um, and Turing machines are one of them, but already at that time of Turing, like there were other alternatives to it. And I think there's probably an infinite variety of alternatives to it, things that can compute anything. Um, so the importance of any one of them is pretty questionable actually in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and where they all differ, isn't in what they can compute, because they can all compute anything. Uh, what they do differ in is how easy they make it to express particular computations. And so if you have a, like a really bad programming language like BrainFuck or whatever it is, or just assembly, uh, it can compute anything, but it just makes it very difficult to express the kinds of computations you would want to run. Whereas a nice programming language like Python or something will make it very easy to express the kinds of computations you want to run, things with loops, things with uh, variables. Uh, that in the space of all possible programs, it turns out that some of those are ones we actually want to run. So we make those easy to express. So that's where languages differ. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, when we ask, what are the building blocks of computation? In a way, the lesson seems to me to be that like, of all the things that can be computed, you can create whatever you want as the building blocks. And then depending on how, what you've assembled there, that will make different computations easy or hard to express. Um, and then that becomes relevant for evolution because it says like, well, okay, well, what kinds of computations should human minds be doing? Okay, and then how is it that evolution put together what is arguably some very shitty computer, uh, but managed to do those computations very well? Uh, because it turns out that those ones were the very, were the ones that were most decisive. Um, I don't think that the ones that are, you see being done um, on an arbitrary program, like the important computation for us isn't iterating through a trillion item list of numbers and multiplying them all by two. That's a computation that computers do, but we don't do in our heads. It would be very difficult for us to do, but evidently that's okay because that's not the kind of thing that we ought to be doing for our normal sort of idea-based uh, computations. So related to Deutsch's ideas on this, how exactly do we know that humans are theoretically universal, that we can theoretically do or understand anything? like? Why is it that we're not like, say, rats, where uh, rats just cannot understand something no matter what you do or try to explain to them? Yeah, I, I don't know if we have like a perfect answer there. That's kind of like my whole research question in a way, is to try to get a clearer picture of what distinguishes us from other things. But um, in my video on universality, I kind of go through a few different ones. So first of all, you have computational universality. And there's also a point I mentioned before about the fact that like, you also want to be able to not only, um, yeah, if you want to have truly unlimited computational capacity, you have to be able to extend whatever finite capacity you have right now. So that's, that's a given. Uh, so you need that too. You can't just be a universal computer because none, none of them actually exist. <laughs> you know, you, you're always going to have a finite computer. So it has to be able to extend its abilities. So that's one kind of thing. Um, and there's also what I mentioned before of like, you need to not only be able to come up with new ideas, but in new ways. And this is the analogy of walking along uh, the earth, uh, just using your feet rather than like planes and so on, like navigate the space of ideas. You need to be able to uh, explore it in many different ways. Uh, and then also you need to be able to distinguish between new ideas of all different kinds in order to efficiently navigate the space of ideas. So if I told you like today, you're trying to decide between two ideas, decide between two ideas, I'm telling you, first of all, like, do you like chocolate or do you like vanilla? Well, that will require certain criteria, but you will have to invent entirely different criteria when it comes to deciding between relativity and quantum theory or the success successors of both of those. Uh, you have to invent new criteria. So if you can't do that, then you're screwed because you're gonna be no better than chance when it comes to that later decision between those new alternatives. Um, and uh, I think there were a few others that I listed out, out there too, but, uh, but yeah, so so I, I would say, yeah, hold, hold off on trying to get a, like a definitive answer perhaps 
on the uh, <laughs> on the question, but that is why I'm working. Yeah, so we'll it's see where that goes. Yeah. And then finally, what do you, how do you picture a good AI future? What does a good future of the AI look like to you? AI or AGI? Actually, let's do both. Yeah, so I don't really know much about AI, really. Uh, so I'll leave it to people who uh, actually work on that to uh, come up with cool stuff. Uh, although I guess I would say that what's cool is the idea of generally having, um, how do I put it? So, so yeah, I think about this large spectrum of like knowledge creating systems. And I think humans are, you know, like the zenith. Like there is like a, a thing that can do anything. That's us and aliens and whatever else. Uh, but then there are these weaker forms and there's evolution. And there's all the kinds of different algorithms in between. And so I think we can imagine, and I'm probably seeing now, systems which are capable of some amount of search in the course of what they're doing. And so they have much more flexibility as a result. So like traditional programs, you would write the whole program. And then if there's any kind of problem at any point in that, where it has a gap in what it knows how to do, the whole thing just fails. It doesn't have any ability to like search for solutions to cross whatever gap it had in its algorithm. Uh, whereas a human, if, if you tell me like, hey, go to the store and get me some, get me that banana or whatever. If there's some problem along the way, you know, and I have to like go around the back door of the place because the front door is under construction or something, like that seems trivial to us. But I had to say like, oh, I want to get into the store. How do I do that? The usual ways doesn't work. So now what? Um, I have to take a detour. Uh, I have to maybe ask somebody. I have to engage in a problem solving process to deal with that situation. So I think you can see other just ordinary programs involving that sort of search just naturally within them and making them much more powerful as a result, even if they're not you know, human level or anything, they don't have to be to be useful. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool, just making search uh, in, in this broader sense into everything that we do. It's pretty cool. Um, and as far as AGI goes, uh, it's mainly just a matter of like, what is it that I like to say? Uh, Longevity, you know, making death optional, um, and uh, you know that that really requires backups ultimately if you want that. Uh, so we need to have control over the hardware we're running on, uh, so we can make backups and have longevity. Uh, and if you have if you have that, uh, we can't guarantee you'll live forever, but we can guarantee like you'll at least live as long as our civilization is around. You know, if an asteroid wipes us everything out, then you die too. Um, we can live as long as civilization at least. And then um, the other one is like uh, virtual reality. I think that once we control like the space of experiences, that will be very cool. We can start designing that. I often like to say that like we could live in like a ten-dimensional reality, if only like we knew how to like throw and catch a ball there. You know, in three D, I can throw a ball and you can like judge distances and so on well enough to catch it. Um, and mathematically, we could do that uh, with ten dimensions. It's just you know that algorithm for doing that isn't in your head right now. So if I throw you a ball in ten dimensions, you won't catch it. <laughs> but there's no fundamental reason you couldn't. Uh, so I think uh, we could inhabit such realities and everything else uh, that we haven't yet imagined. Um, so those are the two that usually come to mind. Um, I think I listed a few more in my latest essay, um, but uh, we'll have to make do with those for now. Yep. All right. So I think that's a pretty good place to wrap it up. So thank you so much, Carlos De La Guardia, for coming on the show. Thanks for listening to this episode with Carlos De La Guardia. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the Theo Jaffe podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Twitter at Theo Jaffe, and subscribe to my substack at theojaffe.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next episode.